Um, tonight, I'm going to introduce the first speaker, um, Kent Bloomer. Kent Bloomer has been called a Renaissance man. He is a sculptor, an educator, a polymath, and an ornamenter. The leading expert in the creation of architectural ornament and a culture warrior for ornament. He has taught at Yale since 1966. He is also principal and founder of the Bloomer Studio and has served as, as its chief designer since 1965. His installation of ornament for the Slover Library in Norfolk has made it one of the most beautiful, quote, one of the most beautiful new library buildings in America, according to businessinsider.com. And the Slover Library has been called, quote, one of the finest new library, new library buildings in the US, end quote, by curbed.com. His books include Body Memory and Architecture, The Nature of Ornament, Biophilic Design, The Theory, Science, and Practice of Bringing Buildings to Life, and Architects and Mimetic Rivalry. Uh, a little bit about Kent the, from what, the first time we interviewed him a few years ago. Um, it created an impression in my mind. I'd like to just share this. I, I'll try to be too long. I'm going to be using some of his words. He attended MIT and studied physics at a time when particle physics were fresh. He examined the physical forces between particles in nature. It wasn't the place for him, physics at MIT. He said, particles are intrinsically, this is a quote, particles are intrinsically non-subjective. So he moved from physics to architecture at MIT. There he found the program, quote, trivialized the human dimension. It relegated a person to the role of a particle in a system, which he said was also applicable to water, sewage, and currency. From there, he transferred to Yale to study design and sculpture under the leadership of Joseph Albers. There he found Buildings, paintings, and sculptures, or sculptures were treated as isolated objects. For Kent, the visual dynamic between man and the environment was lacking. After 10 years of teaching, examining, and experiencing objects and buildings, he conceived of the book Body, Memory, and Architecture. The book places the human body at the center of one's understanding of architecture form. Since publishing Body, Memory, and Architecture, he has studied phenomenon in which macro, micro his words, microstructures such as buildings, bowls, scarves, were perceived as being implicitly connected to macrostructures, um, that is, cosmos, uh, extrospective rather than introspective events. Um, quote, ornament succeeds to incorporate all of the above while substantially enriching architectural language by relocating expressions of the self within expressions of cosmos. As I said earlier, we are for several generations unschooled in the role and design and creation of ornament, except as an artifact of the past. Tonight, I hope you leave here with a new understanding of the possibilities of ornament as a language relevant to the 21st century and to ecology, obviously. Thank you very much, and I present Kent Bloomer. Thank you, Randy, and thank you, uh, AIA, and all the uh, people who have attended this. I, um, it's terrific I'm, uh, to be down here in, in Baltimore, actually. Well, I won't go into that right now. Um, it's, it's, I, I love it. I, we took a tour today. It's the second time I've spent an, a whole day in the city in my life, um, and it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, so thanks for all that. Um, I'm going to be a bit of a nerd, I'm afraid, tonight, because I have the academic challenge of defining ornament. You, I don't think you can really define an ornament, but one can try, and I'm going to do this and say why. Um, I'm going to propose that ornament might be a powerful instrument also um, in addressing the life of Baltimore and its harbor. Focusing on the vast edge world, uh, as described by Ed Casey, <clears throat> maybe not. Maybe ornament will not appear to be what we should be thinking about. However, let's 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 take a look at what ornament is supposed to do. Either way, we cannot evaluate. We we certainly cannot evaluate the pro uh, the proposal. Um, we cannot eval evaluate the 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 role of ornament without asking the essential question, what is ornament? Um, what precisely is, is it? Why, what, where does the word come from? 
<clears throat> Attempting to define the term ornament has become the single most vexing, important, and fascinating project in my 40-year effort to conduct a seminar on the theory and function of ornament and its design in the architecture of today's world. The subject was removed from study within virtual, virtually all academies of art, design, and architecture after World War II. Canceling a subject of study for more than 70 years, especially one that had been conventionally understood for centuries, is not just obscuring information, it's destroying knowledge. <clears throat> it was in the mid-1950s when I first countered an academic rejection of ornament in, in, in an architecture school at that moment, or a program, in a classroom when a fleeting image, one of the entrance base of Sullivan's Carson Peary Scott building flashed on, two next, only to be quickly edited by tilting the projector. <laughs> Upward with the instructor's explanation that the street level architecture of the building was of no interest. <laughs> Three, um, that's the street level. They said, look at the upper floors. Rushing to the library, I discovered astonishing and memorable examples of Sullivan's work augmented by texts. Next. That's the great photograph by Sarkowski that we, uh, that many of you, I'm, I'm sure, have, have seen um, <clears throat> of the street level. At the end of my fourth year, this is at MIT, I, tra I transferred to the Department of Design, administered by Joseph Albers, where I spent three years exploring symmetry operations, color and gestalt theory, uh, the Gestalt theory, we were talking about this in the train coming down, is sort of the precursor of, of the um, uh, mm, study of the, of the brains that is going on now with, uh, in, in, in the advanced visual lab, lab, laboratories. Visual semiotics, uh, semiotics and architecture and making sculpture, that's what I was doing. That's why I went there. R Rudolf Arnheim was preparing his seminal book at that time called Visual Thinking, which was published in 1969. Prior to that, as many of you may know, visual was not, uh, what we call visual thinking today, because we all do it today, was not considered a, 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 fu a fully fleshed out way of thinking. Um, and this was disputed and uh, in some schools, it's now given the same status as verbal and numerical thought and has achieved finally full citizenship in academe. After graduating, I taught basic design in architecture for five years at Carnegie Tech alongside William Huff from the Hochschule für Gestaltung in Ulm, thus updating my new Bauhaus legacy. So basically, I have an, a Bauhaus education. Um, at, at the same time, I was exploring and making connections uh, between sculpture and walls. Next. That was one of my first own projects um, for the Temple Road of Shalom in Pittsburgh. Next. And then I started examining the way what we call sculpture could, 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 could be put inside walls or architectural space. Six, and that led to this lobby uh, ornament for the North Shore Plaza in Pittsburgh. At that time, I was interested in an equilibrium between the expressive power of modern sculpture mediating with contemporary ideas about walls. So I returned to New Haven in 1966 to teach when the extreme canons of Euromodernist design were being challenged. In 1977, I introduced a seminar titled The Theory and Design of Ornament and put it into the architectural program, the undergraduate and graduate programs in the university. This seminar included analyzing historic ornament. This is how I, I went about it because Assume, assume that I didn't know what ornament was either. I mean, I didn't know what it was. I just knew, I just sort of knew what it was um, because it was generally known what it was. 
prior to its erasure from the curriculum. Um, so the problem there was how do you start a course in it with the absence of clear knowledge and, and clear discourse on the subject. The seminar therefore included analyzing historic ornament found in the extraordinary 19th century encyclopedias of ornament, such as Owen Jones' seminal grammar of ornament, Racinet's polychrome ornament, and Dolmetsch's treasury of ornament. The encyclopedias illustrated figures belonging to all ages, from Stone Age to modern industry. We also read the theoretical works from the second half of the 19th century, such as Ruskin's Seven Lamps of Architecture, Regal's Still Froggen, or Problems of Style, and Goodyear's Grammar of the Lotus. And from turn of the century writing such as Hamlin's Rigorous History of Ornament, and later Gombrich's Sense of Order. It was interesting that by the beginning of the 20th century, because of all the research on ornament, that evolved out, out of the encyclopedias led to a chair in Ornament of Columbia, which is where Hamlin wrote uh, a, a definitive history of it. But it was the first real effort to sort of identify it that way. Um, so the seminar's first axiom, our seminar's mine, was in order to perform Figures of ornament must be systematically and spatially engaged, engaged with the material, the form, and the spatial and structural logic of the thing being ornamented. In particular, ornament must be a semantic property of that thing. That is to say, it must share the narrative and meaning of the thing being ornamented. The figures of ornament by themselves were not to be portable or self-sufficient objects or works of art per se that could be exhibited within the isolated white precinct of a museum. In other words, ornament cannot be autonomous. At first, we studied various types of sites belonging to conventional architecture into which ornament could be distributed. Systems of geometry and types of animated uh, figures such as abstract foliage were specified, which is because they were the dominant uh, figures that showed up in, in, in the deep hist history of ornament. Those first steps carried the early seminars through a history of styles which revealed that ornament thrived in the thresholds or liminal regions of the things being ornamented. So that, that was our first major finding. If you look at a Greek amphora or a, a Victorian office building, you'll see that the ornament is located on the edges of those objects. Not, it, it was not arbitrarily distributed, but focused on, on what we've been calling the edge world. <clears throat> um, that was an important finding. And I think the first big step forward in the seminars uh, sort of own trajectory of, um, but it failed, um, but, 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 but it failed to explain um, the complex grammar sim simply because um, the, the, the ornament was in the liminal regions, I'm saying here. Um, this, it failed, that alone failed to explore the complex grammar that united ornament with the bodies of its holders. Okay, that's where it was, but how does this unite it? The, crystal, the critical question remained, what particular function or visual content, presumably absent in the holder, is gained by incorporating ornament? Unfortunately, in the mid-19th century encyclopedias, and just, just let me talk just quickly about those encyclopedias. In the 19th century, uh, an extraordinary thing was going on internationally in the knowledge about this subject. One was uh, objects from all over the world, this was the post-colonial period, were being moved into museums that were basically, that didn't exist in, until the uh, 19th century. So there was an unpacking of crates of all of this visual stuff coming in. And in museums uh, like the Fine Arts Museum in Vienna, like the Brooklyn Museum, uh, 
like uh, I can go on and on about where the, uh, the, the, these were happening. The British Museum, as they were uh, sort of bringing work in from their empire, they noticed that um, this extraordinary work um, seemed somehow similar as it was coming in from all over the planet. Um, so people like Owen Jones, um, who had experienced a little bit of ornament because he had shared the, um, the restoration of the Alhambra with, with, uh, with an archaeologist, um, uh, was the first to, to actually put together a major encyclopedia, which, is a, which if, if you see the original, is an imperial folio with color uh, from um, chromolith lithographic processes showing world ornament. And the others were follow-ups on that. That could only have happened in the 19th century. That was a period in which, in a sense, the history of ornament was for the first time documented. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the fa so, so, so going back to where I was, the problem with those encyclopedias was that most of their, uh, could, could you go on to the next slide, num number eight? This is the kind of pages that appear, for example, in Owen Jones' Grammar of Ornament. Um, and notice that they just show the figuration in ornament. They don't show the connection between the ornament and the thing being ornamented. That is, they uh, do not include the holders of ornament. That omission compromised our project because we could not study the mechanisms that rigorously unified its figures with its holders. So here we had all the information on what, or what ornament had been generally produced, if I can combine those two, um, without knowing where it was precisely located. Nevertheless, the details inside those illustrated parcels, especially their intimate systems of organization, could be carefully analyzed and deconstructed, which revealed that a very limited number of basic geometric forms were common to thousands of examples throughout the world. This was another important finding because it showed that a common or very specific family of figuration existed in the language of ornament. Now I'm starting to call it a language. Regardless of the types of things being ornamented or the very specific periods, places, cultures, geography, and technology in which they appeared. A large percentage of the figures were either starkly geometric uh, or were geometry morphing into abstractions of life forms like the leafage, the palmettes that you see up there. Nine, next, next, uh, yeah, okay. This is also, uh, actually this, this is out of Dalmich, which is a little later. Um, we found that um, the West, the Western excursus, the one that, that basically is Greco-Roman Western and, and actually you could proceed that with the Egyptian, tended to abstract life forms from leaves while the early Chinese incorporated serpent, serpents where you would have found the, the leaves in the, in the Western. Islam, which is, this is, this is a page on Islamic ornament from Dalmich, favored pointed stars and leaf-like arabesques the things up on top, on the top margin. But those exceptions actually proved a rule. Abstract plants and animals primarily serve as energy diagrams rather than symbols. It would take me time to argue that because I'd have to go through a, a, a lot of comparative examples. But basically what these animals and serpents and arabesques are doing are providing energy diagrams and I'll come back to that. Um, it's, it's uh, one of the ways I think that that ornament got messed up during the period when it was canceled was that it began to be regarded as, as, as belonging to a symbol system. A symbol, though, is something that's portable. A symbol can be autonomous. 
it is not site specific, which is the case of ornament. Ornament is extremely site specific and you can't put it in your pocket and carry it around. Um, so uh, I'll just mention that with the short time we have, that in itself would take, take an afternoon to, to, to explain. Um, okay, so indeed, the small, uh, go to 10, uh, okay. Indeed, the small clusters of animated foliage entangled with elements of pure geometry. This is Chinese from, from the uh, Ming Dynasty um, on uh, this clause in A. Um, exhibit a contest of forces. Um, the, cl the clusters of animated foliage entangled with pure geometry exhibit a contest of forces synonymous to the way an entire body of ornament exhibits convolution, convolution when it becomes entangled with the stationary forms of a rigid structures, such as a building. So you, 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 you have this movement and you have the statics. Um, so these two together v visualize the shape of differentiation itself. In the early 20th century, ornament also began to be discussed then as a unique worldwide language with its own alphabet, this had been discovered, and with a visual grammar. Henri Fossilone, in his 1934 masterpiece, The Life Forms in Art, declared in a chapter entitled Forms in the Realm of Space that ornament was, and here I quote Fossilone, perhaps the first alphabet of our human thought to come into close contact with space. The origin and persistence of the alphabet's classical tropes. Let's go to the next one. By classical tropes, I'm going to go back to the basic geometry used in uh, our hemisphere that I, I simply call the Mayan key. If you go up on top, this is the key to the construction of ornament used in the Western Hemisphere, and it's still being practiced today in, in, in this hemisphere um, by those who know it. It, it basically consists of that, of that step that goes into a spiral and something called a hook. It's called the step and hook. And then this is how you repeat it. And this is, this is how you repeat the entire figure. This is how you repeat the hook. And this is how you repeat the step. And I'll come back to the issue of repetition next. In China, uh, the basic key was the one you see on the top, on the left, which is something that sort of goes like this. It's, 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 it, it, it's very difficult to repeat it because when it does this, it congregates. If you drop down and, and try to repeat it, you have to have a void between each one of them. However, there's there, and it's the same. There, there's another version of that. Uh, that well, I'll, I'll keep dropping. Um, it was finally. Uh, I, it's hard to see these things. Don't worry. It's bad. Um, it was finally solved uh, in the Chinese history of ornament that they could in fact repeat that yin yang form. An interesting thing about it is, if you go to the far left, can, can you hear me now? If, if you go to the far left, you see that, what I'm calling the Chinese key, and then I'm softening the edges. The more you soften them, it finally turns into an actual yin-yang form as we know it. Next. Next is ours, the, the Western ornament, which is predicated on the upper left with something called the Greek key. And that is also the same as the swastika, which was a beautiful piece of geometry until it was, in, until it was misused um, in, in its meaning. The, the Greek um, key repeats, as you see, it, has, it doesn't break. It, it, if you go down to these two figures here, this is where we've softened the edges. It actually turns into a wave action. So here are the basic, what I'm calling keys, the, the Inca key or the Mayan key, 
the Chinese key and the Western key. And what's interesting about them is, is yes, they're dissimilar, but what's extraordinary is how similar they are. Next. And by the way, over time, these cultures borrowed from each other, except for the West, for the Mayan, which, which in, for, for which the problem was too great because of the crippling of, of, of the development of that culture. Um, excuse me. So what I'm showing you is the sort of absolute rudiments of ornament. Um, as I just said, uh, Fosilone declared these first moves uh, to be um, uh, the first alphabet of our human thought to come into close contact with space. and. This is all, can, can be taken all the way back to Stone Age instruments. Um, what this suggests is that our all too relentless pursuit of innovation does not apply to the content of ornament. That ornament's content is not necessarily subject to this phenomenon that we call innovation. It is so fundamental that it does not um, itself, the internal change. For example, this is a, a, an ornament designed by, um, by Lewis Sullivan on the Carson Peary Scott, which has underneath it the basic spiral structures of the, of the Greek ornament, but they're heavily foliated, and he sort of puts the whole thing on steroids, so it becomes that, you know, it becomes a very strong impression, but it's really still dependent on that fundamental trope. Um, so the fact that ornament doesn't um, necessarily, or perhaps we can be more strident and say does not, uh, it, uh, have to rely on the innovation because it has been predominantly invariant through thousands of years of technological progress. That was an important finding in the seminar. For example, ornaments adherence to a, rigor, a rigorous system of repetition with linear repeats of two and a half more cycles reveals one of its most universal and definitive tropes. Um, the reason for that is if you, if you repeat something just twice, it'll recongeal into a singularity. You ha this is a gestalt phenomena. You have to go back two and start the third to, to indicate that it's continuing. Um, so that al almost all of, of, of the studies and reports on individual or, uh, or, or on ornament throughout history will use two and a half or more cycles. Now, here, here's where it becomes, be, becomes kind of interesting. Ornaments portions of regular repetition without um, firm beginnings or endings, which would be the two and a half plus, evoke moments of infinity or the unlimited. In early Greek philosophy, fin infinity was a property of chaos which was the opposite of order. Thus, ornament's suggestion of relentless repetition could be read as a visual expression of chaos. Yet, the axis of repetition in the examples of ornament is immediately challenged by being divided into phrases, which you saw in the keys, which by themselves express beginnings and endings, zigs and zags, spirals, fractals, syncopation, and metamorphosis. Those intervening phrases or tropes provide moments of unity and resolution. Harmonic orchestration begins within those phrases in which animated shapes perform a dance and around the relentless stream of infinity. Lively expressions of counterpoint play in all scales of ornament, whether upon the smallest bowl or the largest building. <clears throat> now, here's one more 
problem that we've been facing in, in recent years, the conflation of the term of the word decoration and ornament in today's dictionaries and everyday parlance has muddied the contemporary discourse. Ornament can be an element of a decorative system. That is, it can be an element of decoration that governs the location and amount of ornament as well as of paintings, furniture, and light fixtures, which are not ornament per se. Decoration is more of a locator based on the concept of decorum or propriety. Decorum expresses the civility of social order, local aesthetic choice, and fashion. But those do not explain the primary visual contents of ornament, as we shall see. For example, one may decorate a room with white walls, but where is the alphabet and the millennial figuration of ornament? Yet a white wall can be considered an act of decoration. Investigating the confusion between decoration and ornament led to a collaboration with uh, Creston Jesperson, who had written the first dissertation on US, in the US on Owen Jones' grammar of ornament. Precisely because ornament's alphabet has remained fundamentally unchanged over thousands of years, it was obvious that we had to visit the origin of the Latin word ornamentum to, to, to determine how and why it became into being in the first place. In the etymologies of Isidore of Seville, written around 670 AD within Plato's Academy, which was the great Latin academy that was developed and used and originated the term, um, we found a breakdown of the word ornament, which resonated with the properties uh, we found in the seminar, particularly geometric ones that were invariant from antiquity to the present. Let me read the definitive paragraph from Isidore's etymology. I'll go to the title of book 13 in the etymologies, which is called The Cosmos and Its Parts. The paragraph is titled The World de Mundo and states, and now I'm quoting Is Isidore directly, the world consists of the sky, the land, the sea, and the creations within them. World mundus is named thus in Latin by the philosophers because it is internal motion, motus, as are the sky, the sun, the moon, the air, and the seas. Thus no rest is allowed to its elements. On this account, it is always in motion." End of quote. Part two in the same paragraph continues, and again I am quoting. Whence to Varro, who, who I'll interrupt the quote, who was the uh, principal et et etymologist of that period that Isidore was, was even referring to. Whence to Varro, the elements seem to be animate because he said they move of their own accord. But the Greeks adopted a term for the word mundus, also meaning cosmetics, derived from ornament on account of the diversity of elements and the beauty of the heavenly bodies. They call it cosmos, which means ornament, for with our bodily eyes, we see nothing more beautiful than the world. End of Isidore's quote. In ancient Greek, their cosmetikos meant visible cosmos. What cosmetikos did was make cosmos, which is a philosophical idea, visible. And thus the laws of nature um, made visible, audible as well, and mobile in centrally harmonic ways. For Isidore, the motions within the cosmos were beautiful. The contents of ornament and cosmos, uh, the latter term most likely coined by the philosopher Pythagoras, a cosmos being defined by Pythagoras, were interchangeable in Western antiquity. So now we have an exchange between ornament and the word cosmos. Um, I, I, uh, I have repeatedly found references to Pythagoras' coining the word cosmos. Um, and, and I think that, that one point I would like to make here is that when the word cosmos was coined, it was by a philosopher, not a scientist. When we think of cosmos today, we immediately, because of the state of our knowledge, uh, would turn to a, a scientific identity. But in fact, it's a philosophical idea. Most specifically, 
ornament was intended to show what the harmony between specific cosmos, cosmic motions looked like. Isidore's list of the specific parts of the cosmos occupy the rest of book 13. For Isidore, the ancient Greek vision of ornament was a detailed astronomic spectacle of the totality, the gestalt of the forces to be witnessed primarily but not exclusively in the outer regions, in the firmament at the edge of the world. The 19th century compendiums of ornament suggest that the seminal ornament of all great cultures was visualizing the order and harmony of the universe. For the designer of ornament, Isidore's chapter provides a program of motions found in the, national, in the natural environment, beginning with heavenly bodies, followed by clouds, oceans, and rivers in second place, and earthly forms in third place. Isidore allows, furthermore, that those motions also exist within the smallest of earthly parts, such as the finest dust and the atoms, which sounds a little bit like particle physics. Note once again his persistent emphasis on motion. Every description of ornament used the word motion that I've just read. The designer of ornament can visually abstract those motions with repetitions, spirals, zigzags, fractals, botanical formations, animated geometry, or as within the 20th century work of Sullivan, with the turbulence of dense foliage, which is what we have here. Um, significantly, um, Isidore's inventory of the world and its parts does not mention man-made objects. His parts only address the eternal motions found in nature. The designer, therefore, would have to consider what sort of details or places belonging to the holder might accommodate the connections between the cosmic motions articulated by ornament and the mundane stabilities innate to their holders. Such details would have to be in transitional places, able to address two or more worlds simultaneously, such as a wall to ceiling, outside to inside, roof to sky, cities with land and water, or rims of glassware and pottery, and occasionally they may be at the dead center of buildings and bowls, which are also places of transition, like the axis of a wheel, axes of a wheel. Those are edge worlds in which the energy of ornament's motions can unite with the gravity of its holders. It is precisely within the spectacle of ornament converging uh, with its holders that the phenomenon of ornament achieves its highest level of meaning. By uniting the substance of the holder with, with the um, in a sense, this, this image of the world at large, our living space is enlarged. Now I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about, and this will be the, this will be the, the, the finish of this description, I'll talk, I'll talk about uh, devices that are used in, in, in architecture, for example, to make a connection between this, 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 this sort of system of motion and the gravitas of, of the object. Um, 15, next slide. If you look at the Parthenon, you'll notice that um, you have the columns, which are the least unornamented part. The bottom of the columns are like the bass drum in, in, in an orchestra. Bam, 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 bam. And then you take it up to the metopes, and, you, and, and the number of those beats are doubled. So what you're looking at is an increase in the number of repeats or the rhythm of the major elements. When you get up into the uh, entablature itself, there's a lot of zigzagging going on. And then when you get to the pediment and go around the edge, you get the pediment ornament, which has the highest number of repeats, or it's the most rhythmic zone. Uh, next, if we go to the Greek orders, um, they're, they're very informative as to how ornament was located in classical architecture. The Greek orders are basically, an these things are basically algorithms of where you place the different parts to order the design of a building. If you look at 
the basic idea, the first thing is a post and a beam. Then you go up to the entablature and up to the pediment, and it's in those connections, in those moments of convergence between the column and the beam, and the convergence of the cornice, the corona of the cornice with the roof, that the ornament occurs. So this, this, this is how uh, one could accept a cannon and locate ornament. Next. Uh, if you go up to the top, these are speculative paintings by students of the Beaux-Arts around 1840, uh, uh, when, when they were certain that the Greek temples were polychrome. And they added the information missing from the bare bones of the building, such as in the Doric order, having the uh, leafage painted onto the capital. And you can see the, the, the rhythmic systems around the edge of the pediment of these basic ornament tropes. Next. If you go to the Gothic, there's another way of doing it. Um, the Gothic is, is really an excursus of the classical. The Gothic has its big drum beats at the bottom, and then it goes up and turns into ribs. The ribs then begin to multiply. When the ribs start multiplying, they produce the trifoils, which are the ornaments. And when it goes up further, it, it produces an octafoil and quatrefoil, so that you get this increase in the rhythmizing of the shafts that then generate the top. Uh, zone in a, in, in a clear story, which is where the ornament occurs, again at an edge. Next. A terrific example of that is the west window of York Cathedral in, 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 at York Minster in England, where, the, where you get this system of, rep, of repetitions in the west window that turns into a botanic event, or it's sometimes called the heart ornament. Um, <clears throat> next, um, if you go into modern uh, architecture such as Sullivan's Getty Tomb, you see the same system um, of using construction where this is a cube and the building is very simply expressed as a, as a construction with blocks, not with ribs or rhythmic systems that start with your basic beats at the bottom, go up, and then at the edges of the Vosier Arch um, and along the upper zone of the cornice, the ornament appears at those key moments. The, uh, the, the plane, the, 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 sea pod, the pea pods are gonna take a different kind of explanation, but they clearly occur in the top half of the face of the building. Next, now I'm gonna show you an entirely different way of converging ornament with architecture. This is the uh, Tashan, uh, Kashan Bazaar in um, Iran. Uh, go to the next, Picture, next slide, okay. This is the building in which that exists. It's basically a, a brick, a stuccoed brick building. It, it could be concrete to, to today if, if we wished. Um, underneath those domes you see the, underneath those mounds you see next what is being shown here. And at the bottom of that, if you read the entire plan of the bazaar, it's very long, it's a couple miles almost, where you walk through and it's full of shops. So as people mill through it, they get to an important point and, it's, and the, the path swells and then the dome appears on top and that's the connection of the architecture through its program and circulation, if I can use that word of people. Um, that's the a moment of, of the appearance of the ornament. Um, next, and here's what you see when you look up at it. What is typical of um, 
Islamic ornament is that these domes are the climactic element. And they have been explained by Graybar and others as being a point of mediation, as the edge between the earth and the heaven. Um, next. So back to our society. Um, let's talk about space being the basis of, of convergence. If you, if you look at Harry Bertoia's uh, uh, construction here inside of Eero Saarinen's Kresge Chapel or place of meditation at MIT, you see it is the space that occupies the ornament, the beam of light coming down that causes, uh, that situates the ornament and connects it to the architecture. So I'm simply calling that um, convergence within the realm of space. Next. And this is what we did at Slover Library in Norfolk. We used convergence. For example, you have a, a, a Beaux-Arts building being expanded. The, the primary expansion of that building is in this five-story kind of minimalist tower. And this is beyond that and in front of that. So the, the connection occurs in the space between these dominant objects. So, so like, but different than uh, Kresge, it, it is a consequence of the energy of two things producing a space, and that becomes the location of the ornament. And I think, we think, that this is where we can go with this in, in our century when we cannot express construction. What? Two, 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 two minutes. Okay, fine. And um, the, um, so I'm going to show you very quickly, I have two, I have two minutes to do this. <laughs> I'm gonna show you very quickly a Victorian, a couple of Victorian solutions to that next. Oh no, okay, this is Slover, next. This is what we did at Slover, next. Next, okay. This, by the way, is worth looking at because it's 6,000 years old. This is from 4,000 BC in, under Romania at the end of the Danube, showing uh, ornament and again proving that, that the system hasn't changed in 6,000 years. Uh, next, but going to England, try this. This is the Crossness pumping station built around 1850 after the grammar of ornament came out and after Ruskin's seven lamps in which ornament was connected with machinery. Next, so that there was a polarity between the cosmos of ornament and the actuality of huge pumping engines that were used to pump out London. Um, next, uh, this, this is uh, another pumping station showing a different way of doing it, which is putting the ornament on the windows and on the capitals so they become sort of metaphors of what's going on in the pump and they do this in, in, in the world of ornament. So the same force is transferred. And the forces, what, the twinning of forces is what allows their connection next. Uh, you, many of you may have seen this at the end of Paddington Station, uh, designed by, uh, or, by or, this, the ornament by Owen Jones. Next, now this is from Frankenstein. And, and, and the reason I show it to you is that now we're looking at a situation where ornament, if we call those things in the middle ornament, which, I, which, is a, which is really a metaphor of ornament, where those rings go up and the lightning comes down through it and some of the other figures, uh, what they're ornamenting is the operation taking place at the table. The amount of electricity that that would take would be a from a generator about the size of, of a Honda alternator. So in order to express the idea of the electricity being used, it is dramatized with, with a second language. 
But the important idea here is the ornamenting of an experiment. Next. And also, this is my last of two slides. This was Frank Lloyd Wright's proposal for the, or, for the ornamenting of the Golden Triangle um, in Pittsburgh. Notice the ornament. The, the ornament, let's, let's go to the next slide. The ornament tends to occur in the steeple that goes up through the middle or in the webbing of the stays of the bridge. Um, this is a very, to me, uh, re revealing instance of Frank Lloyd Wright's genius that he had broken through the oncoming condemnation was, and was able to, des to design something in a waterfront which used ornament. But notice that to put the ornament on the steeple, he had to super add the steeple to his scheme. And this has been taking place throughout the history of ornament. You have to put an instrument into ornament and then recompose that into the basic design. I think I can stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. you might want to walk that way. Or okay. If you want to walk that way, it wouldn't be there. It's a little dark back there. Our next speaker is uh, Chris Streb with Biohabitats. I'm going to be brief, but I just would like to say that when we were looking at um, this, this whole program, the name that kept coming up was Biohabitats and Chris Streb. And I think Baltimore is very fortunate to have an organization like Biohabitats in Baltimore. I, hope, uh, I didn't know much about the organization. Chris is a practice leader with Biohabitats, leading the firm's research and development effort called BioWorks. He's an ecological engineer with 20 years of experience in restoration and regenerative design. Combining engineering, ecological design through biomimicry lens, he approaches every project as an opportunity to create and restore functional life support systems. I'm going to let you read the rest of this in the, in the uh, program, and I'm going to introduce Chris Streb. All right, good, good evening, everyone. Um, I first off would like to, to say that uh, we did have some technical difficulties in the beginning. And I understand that I've lost my video and I'm terrified now, of course, uh, but then I had a really good idea. So instead of actually showing videos, I'm going to ask my colleagues to come up and do interpretive dance uh, of the underwater. So you all are gonna be very well entertained because they're excellent dancers. Um, okay, so uh, I am here tonight to uh, speak about engaging the edge. And I mean, this is, this is what we've been doing uh, with, Great. I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with so many people, um, so many great uh, nonprofits on the Baltimore waterfront. Um, and the w tonight I'll be focused on. You can hit the next slide. Actually, I'm not sure if this is this is the drone image that uh, I can't do an interpretive dance of this one, unfortunately. But uh, this is actually a drone image of, um, Chase, of Chase Pier. This is an old derelict pier at the base of Caroline and Thame Street. And this is a remnant of our past. The, 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 tonight I wanted to show really a way of reimagining a concept uh, to bring new life to this pier, to not only uh, preserve a cultural artifact, but to convert this pier into a life support system, to make it a habitat, to make it a water quality device uh, for the harbor, and importantly, as a, as a sentinel for people to engage with the harbor and to understand what's happening within the harbor. Uh, before I can get into all that, though, I think it's really important to understand, I think, what Ken had alluded to, this, this, uh, this loss of knowledge, the loss of, the loss of function um, that's occurred throughout, in large, in large part because of the transformation that's happened along the waterfront over the past three centuries. Uh, so let's, let's hit the next slide, please. So, of course, uh, Baltimore um, was very much a working waterfront. It was a, it was a harbor town. Um, and this is a big part of our legacy, that redevelopment, in some ways, we're losing. We have the Domino Sugar Plant, but Chase Pier is the last vestige of 
that old working waterfront on the north side of the harbor. Um, so up, actually up at the top of the site is Harbor Point. That was one time the Baltimore Chrome Works, uh, which was started in 1845 and ran all the way up through 1985, uh, leaving a really nice toxic legacy of hexavalent chromium in our harbor. Um, so this pier was, I mean, Fells Point was, you know, some parts of it were the same. The residential parts, of course, were the same. But there was a lot of industry happening along it. Let's hit the next slide. Let's go back in time. So my understanding is there's two rails, actually, that run. And if we'd had the drone image, you would have seen those. There was two rails that ran down Chase Pier. And uh, this was in an area where ships would moor up. Goods would come in from the eastern shore, um, you know, cantaloupe and produce, and it would be distributed through these rail carts, or, you know, through the tracks and, and the streets. And, and I'm going to do a little bit of uh, my Baltimore puffery here. Um, this is, I, I can't help but imagine that these horses were pulling uh, some of the goods up to my great-grandfather's store uh, on Lombard and Castle Street, uh, and then, of course, um, he, was a, he was a butcher of Butcher's Hill, and he would distribute his goods. Um, and that's a picture of him in, I don't know what year, I think it's 1920-ish. Um, uh, so he would distribute those goods throughout the neighborhood. So I'm very proud of the fact that I'm the great-grandson of a butcher. Um, so Chase Pier, it's, before it was really an industrial area, it was also an area where there was um, it, uh, a lot of shipmaking was happening. So these were all shipyards where um, clippers and skipjacks were probably being built. You can go back in time. This is a, the, the next slide is a, uh, this is actually an amazing image uh, produced by the, I think the Image Research Center uh, and at the University of Baltimore County uh, in collaboration with the Maryland Historical Society. This is Baltimore in 1812. I encourage you all to go look this up because you can zoom in. It's super high resolution. It's kind of like a two and a half D. Uh, but what's remarkable about this is how much the, the shape of the waterfront has had changed all, just in those 40 years from the last image to this image. Uh, in fact, there's this large embayment. That little that peninsula out there is Harbor Point. Caroline Street couldn't even go through. It would have it, they had to fill in that embayment to have Caroline Street, which um, and a, there's a, a, I don't have a pointer, do I? Uh, anyway, so there are a lot of a lot of changes happening. Let's go to the um, what's happened. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm stuttering here. Um, the what's missing, I think, in this is really what was the landscape. I mean, we see a lot of agriculture. Um, but what was, what was there before? What were the functions that were happening before even this urbanization took place? So let's hit the next slide. So of course, before Baltimore was Baltimore, it was a marsh. And so marshes form in these quiescent waterways. Um, these are areas where <clears throat> um, you have carbon, nutrient, sediment, all depositing, all being transformed. And this is another way of thinking about a working waterfront. Of course, in the, the past images, we were thinking about the exchanges of goods uh, for, and services, the production of goods and services. This is a very different form of, uh, of exchange, um, of transforming those basic elements into life. Let's hit the next slide. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Um, and so, of course, marshes have all these incredible uh, functions and services that they're providing uh, to improve our, our world. Uh, or, I mean, not, 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 a, not to be teleogenic. Um, but, of course, uh, they, they improve water quality. They provide essential habitat uh, for a host of organisms. They provide uh, provision of goods, um, of food, for example, carbon sequestration, shoreline protection, et cetera. You can read all this. Um, so what's happened though, oops, can you hit the next slide? Sorry. Um, the transformation of our waterfront really has been an exchange for one type of working waterfront for another. Uh, in the bottom image, in order to create navigable, navigable waterways, we needed to excavate out that material. And what they did, they needed a place to deposit it. So they filled in the old tidal wetlands and they put up vertical walls, reclaimed land. All of a sudden, you have a, um, all, new this, all this new real estate. You can bring your ships right up to shore. 
but we've sacrificed a lot of the ecological functions that occurred. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and this is pretty incredible. And, uh, so this is a, uh, Air St. Gross uh, did this analysis of seven, from 1792, I think, uh, is this map. Uh, hit the next slide. Look, this is today. How much, uh, that's the existing water surface of today. So I, I, that looks to me to be about uh, almost a 50% loss of the harbor's water footprint. So, and this is another Air St. Gross um, diagram, which I think is great. So, of course, as we've been doing this urbanization, it's not just the water edge. The harbor is impacted by the entire watershed. So with the increase of development throughout the watershed, we've had this decline in the ecology uh, of the harbor. I like to think the 21st century, we're actually beginning to reverse this. Um, that's yet to be seen. I think we are seeing that happening with our Chesapeake Bay grades. Um, but this is a great, I, I think this is a great um, example of of uh, the processes that have been occurring. You can hit the next slide. And of course, the way we see this, the way that we see the impact of this, the, the most obvious way is the trash. So I think people have, uh, can viscerally respond to trash in the waterway as it being an unpleasant um, and you know, something that should be unacceptable. But what's really bad is when the water quality uh, with all the nutrients and sediment flowing in from the watershed triggers these algal blooms, these harmful algal blooms, and the harmful algal blooms plus low dissolved oxygen cause these fish kills. And this happens quite frequently. Next slide. So we did a little analysis just to think about the edge and what processes, really what processing potential we have. Because really where the processing of these nutrients and sediments is happening is largely on the surface. Um, and so, just looking at the entire Baltimore Harbor, there's about 15 miles of vertical shoreline. You can hit the next slide. If we think about that intertidal area, that, that um, zone that's dynamic and pulsing, um, this is one of these process that, uh, processes that people don't think about a lot. This is where you had basically all of the basis of the food chain uh, being produced. And you look at the difference of the surface area, vertical surface area, and we just assumed a 10 to 1 slope. This is a pretty uh, conservative slope, and many, many marsh fringes are a lower slope than that. It's basically a 90% reduction in potential habitat. Next slide, please. And so the, the, the question is, is, how do we reverse this? How do we, we can't restore all of these marshes. We can't restore Baltimore's edge to be what it was. We have to re-envision it. And uh, through our work uh, with Air St. Gross and the National Aquarium, this is the potential concept for, uh, this is the plan uh, really for the, the canal between areas three and four. Uh, the, intent, the intention of the National Aquarium is to create an outdoor exhibit of a Chesapeake Bay landscape. But instead of just being a, a land, a, an interpretation or an exhibit of that, they really want it to be a functional system to provide habitat and to address the water quality issues, to be a life support system. So this would be like a refuge during these periods where the rest of the harbor might be having an algal har a harmful algal bloom. Next slide, please. So you can see that um, various, each part of the system actually can support various organisms from reptiles and waterfowl to crustaceans. Um, and then of course there's the plant species as well. Uh, so uh, what, what we have on the bottom of the, the, uh, this floating marsh system is a bunch of aeration. So we're mixing the water uh, to de-stratify it, and this helps prevent the harmful algal blooms as well. You can go to the next slide. And this is where I invite my friends from Biohabitats to do that. <laughs> this is a, this is, uh, you can all look this up, actually, for the National Aquarium. You may as well just go to the next slide. Um, this would have shown you some of the underwater observations that they've been making. Um, and I just wanted to show that because it proves that there is life in the, in the harbor. Um, and when you add these, uh, when you add air and when you add habitat, the life comes immediately. There's ghost anemones, um, there's barnacles, there's uh, crabs coming on, this, on the pilot. 
there are um, Atlantic silversides, et cetera. So all of these uh, species have been observed, and some, have, uh, some, no one was even aware that they were present in the harbor until we put the pilot in and until the National Aquarium actually started to do uh, underwater camera work. Um, and so that, that is a, a, a great new example, I think, of a healthy harbor practice that's really trying to uh, restore the functions of a marsh uh, in the system and address many of the other issues, too. Uh, so we have a, a, a little portfolio now of interventions that have happened associated with the healthy harper. Uh, you've got the Great Oyster Gardening Project, which is a great way um, that Adam Lindquist uses to engage uh, various corporations to grow some oysters. You've got the floating wetlands. You have Mr. Trash Wheel, who's become an international sensation. Um, and then you've got the uh, our Bond Street uh, floating wetlands, which were, were um, uh, made for Brown Advisory, and Mike Hankin being a real champion of the healthy harbor. And then, of course, there's Professor Trash Wheel. And the, the question is, is we, don't, we only have one area where we have a life support system uh, on this North Shore. And with 2020 right here, right now, just around the corner, we have time to get a second life support system. And so I, I, this is a, you can hit the next slide, please. Um, so here's our Chase Pier. This is, maybe many of you have seen this. Um, if you've walked down along, uh, along Thames Street, um, you, I'm sure you've noticed, seen it. Um, so in 2011, we, we hit the next image, please. Um, in 2011, we just did a little Photoshop rendering. We uh, presented this at the end of uh, the Healthy Harbor report. And this image was uh, so striking to, to, I think, the audience there that um, Laurie Schwartz said, please do a feasibility study. We did a feasibility study, and then with uh, generous funding from uh, the Able Foundation, uh, we went ahead into a schematic design uh, and did some real testing. So you can move on. Um, this is a, the structure is in pretty bad shape. Uh, there are lots of holes in the decking. The piles are rotting. Um, so the question was, could it even support this load? Go ahead to the next one. Well, we got a uh, McLean out there, and they did some load testing. Uh, we did we did a deflection. Looked at the deflection of the beams. Go ahead to the next slide. So this is a pretty big rig uh, that they, they brought out here. Um, it actually d seems to just dwarf the pier. <laughs> but poor little pier. Go ahead, you can hit the next slide. Um, the, you know, when, when we started to think about the design too, we started to realize, wow, these materials are rotting and that's what gives them such great character. How do we maintain that gritty authenticity um, without, like, I guess without papering over the history and you know, making it lo look all pretty? Um, you know, so how does it really retain that working, uh, that sense of working uh, that, I don't know, the, to me, I guess the grit, the grit uh, um, generates that, that sensibility. So we were looking at just different um, old timbers and uh, sheet piles, which would corrode over time and get that real rustic experience. We also recognized that there might be a need for lighting, um, but maybe just being really refined about the lighting. Um, and so just maybe gently tucking it into underneath that curbing as like a little perimeter bead of light. Uh, go ahead, you can go to the next one. Oh, go back. Um, this is, this, this is a, a Paul Daniels sculpture. Um, this is called a Wurtz pump. And the idea was, this was, we loved the idea of just this mechanical means of lifting the water um, to actually provide the water, uh, uh, the water supply to the, treat to the treatment wetland at the top. So he, he built this working model and he's even scaled that up uh, to something that's on the order of 10, 12 feet tall um, and he's lifting water six, seven feet with this. Um, now the downside is we don't always have wind down there. So um, go ahead, but to the next slide. Uh, that, that those waterfalls, one of the things that we liked about the waterfall, we really liked that visual look of, uh, of a waterfall, the white water uh, kind of effect. And we thought that was good because it's making little beads of water, which is increasing the aeration and increasing the turbulence in the receiving water column. Uh, so we wanted to understand what kind of flow rate are we talking about if we create these weirs and how do, how do we break up that water? The more water we, the only way you can generate white water is through a lot of water and a lot of, sub subsequently, a lot of energy. Um, 
Or if you use a low amount of water, you get this laminar flow, kind of this sheet that people might not even see. Um, so some of this is just our photography we weren't able to capture, but we built this like curtain of chains and, um, in the lab, and then we just ran the water, and so we were able to use a small flow of water but generate that white water effect. Um, but of course the light, um, our speed of our lens was too fast on that. Um, so anyway, we have, we, we got that far and that was good progress on that part of the, the project. So go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so the idea of the waterfalls is that they're not always running. Um, we really thought this is the sentinel part of the waterfalls, that there, we put dissolved oxygen sensors uh, into the water column. The lower the dissolved oxygen, the higher the water flow. Uh, the, the higher the dissolved oxygen, the, water flow, the waterfalls uh, turn off. So that was the general idea to conserve energy, to really use the system as a signal. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, and so this is what we came up with at the end of schematic design. So you've got um, Paul's uh, Wurtz pump and sculpture in the middle, constructed wetland on top, and the, and the waterfalls around the perimeter. So th these are basically two different systems. So the, the wetland is treating and filtering the water, and the waterfalls are mixing the water um, and signaling that there's a dissolved oxygen issue. So, um, so we, got to, we got to this, we priced it, and this is really where the project kind of got stuck. Um, we <laughs> go figure. Um, so we, you know, we came in, the, the other issue was the maintenance cost. So uh, there, was, there was some determination to have the waterfalls run more frequently. Um, that, of course, requires more energy. And so it was pushing the annual maintenance to be you know, $40,000, $50,000 a year just to maintain the energy as well. Um, as well as just the pump replacement, et cetera. Uh, so we needed to really rethink that and, and um, you know, how do we drive this, this energy demand with solar? I mean, this really should be kind of independent of itself. So anyway, with 2020 coming, let's go to the next slide. We really wanted to revision this and, and, and kind of clean it up for uh, today's standards. I mean, there's a lot of technological changes that have actually happened in the last few years. Um, solar has dramatically dropped in price, so this is the this is one of the drone Im images that we took, and then we um, did some rendering on top of that. And so there's basically three different systems here right now. Let's hit the next slide. Uh, we thought we could phase these out. So this solar array, uh, this is uh, in essence, I think, a uh, size solar array that would be suitable for. Uh, suitable if we have a, on, on a pure battery power that we could actually power up these uh, waterfalls when we need them. So we need to optimize when we need them. Hit the next one. This is the constructed wetland. Again, this is filtering, and this would filter, you know, between 50 to 100,000 gallons of water per day uh, through kind of a tidal pulsing, and that was the idea, is that we mimic the tide. We pump water in, you fill it, and then you let the system drain out, you pump it up again. So in essence, it's kind of like a super wetland with, uh, because we could increase the frequency of that, that tidal flux. You wouldn't get as much treatment the faster you do it. Uh, but anyway, that, that is, um, that's one of the options. And then the final piece of this is the waterfalls. So, um, and you can just go right to the next slide because this is really where you see the function of the waterfalls. Go ahead, you can hit it again. So the waterfalls are mixing the water, but if we have the intakes on the interior of the pier, we can actually pull the water through this uh, high surface area media that we install under the pier. That media can serve as hiding areas for fish, uh, a food source for fish as, the, as you get all of these uh, smaller invertebrates um, uh, feeding on what's grow the, the biofilms that are growing on that. Um, and so you're just generating this whole circulation uh, uh, process. And so this would really dramatically increase in, uh, the, the water quality in this, in this location. And really, it's not going to fix the entire harbor, but you're going to have a very healthy zone for aquatic habitat. So let's go to the next slide. So finally, the engagement piece. So we've... Um, there's a lot of different ways that people could engage with this too. Now, the smartphones from, I mean, most, a lot of people had smartphones in 2011 and 2012, but not everybody. Everybody has a smartphone now. So 
um, it's not a problem to program an app just to say, you know what, I want, I see the dissolved oxygen's low. I really want to get a selfie with the waterfalls running. Can I turn it on? So it, it, we could make it turn on. Um, or maybe get some exercise, jump on a bike and you know, see how much power you can generate. But obviously you're not gonna even run a trickle of water, um, but you could at least turn a signal on and get, get, the, get, the, get the pumps running. So you know, we think there's a lot of opportunity just to have this visceral engagement of pedaling and seeing um, and hearing what's happening. And so in essence, the, the, whole the, the whole idea of this project kind of lifts all of these functions and processes of a wetland up out of the water and suspends it so that people can visualize it and understand it. Let's hit the next slide. Um, and the last piece of this is, you know, some of the feedback that we've received is that how do you get on the pier um, or can you get on the pier? And, you know, we've really struggled with that. It's, 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 it's actually just an accessibility issue. Uh, the height of the curbing and the proximity of the promenade makes a, a pretty steep slope. Um, but it also takes out treatment area if we have people. So we thought uh, one option would be just to do some floating docks. And so um, this, is, this is where we are with this project right now. And um, again, it's been kind of latent for the last five or six, year, six years, I would say. And we think it's time to reconsider it. And I guess um, you can hit the next slide. Um, I want to thank all, everybody that we've dealt with on the harbor and that, who has given us an opportunity to explore this edge. Um, and finally, I want to go to the last slide. If you're interested in this project, um, one more. <laughs> so you can hashtag it. To, go to Wet Wharf at Biohabitats. Um, let's see if we can generate some interest if you think this is worthwhile. Uh, pursuing. The more interest we can show, the more we can go around and try to shop this to potential funders. And I really welcome anybody's feedback and ideas uh, for how we can make this better. Um, we look at this as a community project um, and something that Baltimore could be really proud of and, and uh, something like another Mr. Trash Wheel from a, uh, a harbor perspective. So um, that concludes my talk and thank you. Hello? We just have a few minutes for questions. We were hoping to have a little bit more time, but we got started late. If you need to leave, we understand. Um, uh, I hope people could uh, get an idea of um, the connection between the two, contemporaneous contextualism maybe. Um, are there any questions? That's a, that's a great question. We were asking Paul if we could get a photo. Of, he wanted us to put his recent sculpture up there and I haven't gotten a shot of it, but yeah, we'll Photoshop it on there for sure. Yeah, I agree. One of the reasons why we put the two of these speakers together was we saw a connection between um, what Chris was doing with this uh, really intriguing project in animating the water and what Kent is talking about. Um, so uh, maybe if there's any more, if there's questions, or we can talk about that. Any more questions? Oh, there's one. He's asking me to repeat the question. Okay. Do you have another question? I'm sorry. Anyone else? He's asking, how do we use 
materiality and texture today, materials today, and then, I'm sorry. That may replace the... Um, replace ornament. Replace so is it possible to replace ornament with materials? Um, Stolery, you know, it's, um, <laughs> what, what, what I was trying to describe, I, I took too much time doing it, perhaps, but um, was that ornament has a specific alphabet. Why after 5,000 years, why after 5,000 years when it's proven that it can do it using that alphabet and using its system of convergence, with that alf with the you know description of ornament the description of the object converging, why would one want to even consider using materials or textures? I mean, well, the the materials or textures are implicit in 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 what has always ex existed. It's a different subject. That's what I would say. The way that I was looking at it is that once you have banished materials, um, and once you banish the ornament, what used to be that sort of stimulating component. Yes, we do, unfortunately. <laughs> and I would say that the a, a better remedy would be to bring back ornament and, and not accept the uh, um, rejection of it. That's, that's what I'm saying. And, and that's what we practiced, and it worked. <clears throat> Another question? I'm going to send this first to Chris, because when we talked to Chris, we were putting this together. We, we showed him the um, Frankenstein image, and we asked him how he might see ornament may connect. So if you may. Yeah, I, I, one of the, I guess, I'd never heard of ornament before, uh, <laughs> before, the, uh, before I was uh, asked to speak here. Uh, but I guess one of the things that really struck me is how um, ornament is kind of a diagramming of these uh, n processes that are happening in nature or the, or the cosmos or, um, and, and it, diagramming that to communicate a certain energy, but also to, I think, engage and lift people's spirit. And in terms of the landscape, I mean, I would say uh, one of the things that I, when I was looking through Ken's presentation uh, in the chapel at MIT is, the, the like, like relating it to Chase Pier, um, could we use a, a kind of beautiful instead of a, a chain curtain, which is just a materiality thing, which we thought would be cool to as it rusts and gets algae and whatnot on it. But what if we did have more of an ornamental pattern on it, so that it's beautiful, just to look at, it, um, that it almost indicates water movement um, through it. So that would be an example on my project, and I, I guess I have a hard time. Thinking, um, um, thinking in terms of larger uh, or other landscape processes w since I've been just focused on, on this for tonight. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I, and I think, uh, I guess the entire movement of uh, water up into that constructed wetland, I mean, the, the notion of pulsing, how do, we, how do we signal that to people more? And so I guess that, that's why I feel like the, the, the idea of engagement where people can actually trigger certain events happening that might be a sort of modern ornament. I don't know. You... Well, when, as far as your project is concerned, which is, which is extraordinary, and, and I'm a great fan of marshes, it would seem to me that, that, that what should be ornamented there is the entire wharf. And the scale of the ornament should be an urban scale. It should have to do with the harbor and, and what's on the land. So that the ornament could, I would say that the, that the ornament could use its own language to, in a sense, celebrate what you've produced, um, but still remain, again, re remain as ornament and, and not try to uh, 
It seems to me that the only thing, if I could, I, I, I was, it, I was trying to say in, in, in a few minutes of what takes over a year to say in, in the classroom. <laughs> Ornament, um, let's see if I can get this right efficiently. Um, let's see now. Um, The function of ornament and, and its in invention, as Isidore described it, was to talk about the motions in the cosmos. And I think that that's what it should always do. It should do just that. And the reason why it's doing that is, uh, has been embedded in its, in its alphabet. And that's why it hasn't changed for 6,000 years. The way that ornament would change today, and it's not the ornament that changes, it's, it's the composition that changes. With new materials, with new functions such as yours, um, what changes is the holder, not the ornament itself. So you have to figure out a grammar to get the ornament to reconnect to, to this new holder. That will produce a different product than has ever been produced. But I don't believe that the ornament per se its particular makeup can can be subject or pressured to innovate. I, I, uh, that would be the same thing as destruction. Mm -hmm. Keep the keep the language and repurpose it for the sort of thing you are doing. And I think that would be perfect because if there if the entire pier were ornamented, qua ornament as ornament, that could contribute to the. Um, beauty of the entire, of that entire edge of Baltimore. Another question right here. Yes, yes, yes. Should I repeat that question or can everybody hear it? Everybody heard it? Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Shinto is highly specialized where it picks very important moments. And I think that is, that is definitely in the family of ornament because, because they have precise things that they put into those moments. I mean, they, they just don't just shine a flashlight on those moments. They put little objects that have the properties of the alphabet that I was talking about. And so did, did you agree? I do, but there's also a ritual, a ritual. And there is a ritual. Yeah. yeah. That, that's right. There, there, there is a ritual. But, um, it could be just a ritual of entrance and exit. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I, I just have oh, yeah. one last thing we're going to have to wrap, but um, yeah. Chris, it struck me that the more successful your peer is, the less action will be going on. <laughs> if that water's oxygenated, is uh, it locally, right? Yeah, then yeah, and I and I think that I, yeah, it's, uh, gotcha. The the other thing that's a challenging with the dissolved oxygen is we'd have to put a lag on it. So if dissolved because the diurnal swing, dissolved oxygen drops in the middle of the night when there's when there's not photosynthesis. So we'd have to put like a six hour lag so that people could see that there was a low dissolved oxygen event. And I think that. The idea of um, just having an, uh, another option for getting the waterfalls to move, is that's why that's important, because it's going to be very boring on 80% uh, of the day, unless there is ornament, which um, maybe shows or somehow reveals that water might move down these curtains. We could continue the, the uh, we got this word from Ed Casey last week, it's polylog. It's when there's more than one person talking, I guess, and uh, or more than two. We're going to continue at the brass tap uh, immediately. So we'll hopefully see you there and have a drink there. Okay? Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> <laughs>